in 1770 that I endorsed it. Go ahead. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the third Thursday Village Time Lecture of the Georgia Historical Society. I'm John Matthewson, the curator, but you all know that. Um, <laughs> today we're um, hosting a great speaker, Ross Conrad, um, a beekeeper who um, studied under the famous Mraz family of Middlebury, uh, learning the uh, beekeeping trade, and in 2007 came out with a groundbreaking book on natural beekeeping called Natural Beekeeping, and which was then revised and expanded in 2013, was it? Yep. Um, and then right before the pandemic started, me and Bill Maris came out with this book here, The Land of Milk and Honey, Copies are available for sale. It's a great book, even includes a little bit on Dorset. Um, and also he is the author of the one of the best reasons, uh, I'm sure you all know, to read Bee Culture Magazine. This is his <laughs> monthly column. Um, this, this most one is Winter Insulation Revisited with a Healthy Serving of Crow. And they can use a better picture of Bee Cross. It's actually a painting. Really? Yeah. Uh, they did a painting and uh, something that did a while back. Okay. Well, in that case, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> and also, he um, is a beekeeper, and he's brought some fancy bee, dancing bee gardens uh, raw honey, if any of you want to buy that afterwards. But I'm going to shut up and let him talk about <laughs> the history of beekeeping in Vermont. Ross. Thank you. Thank you. Hi everybody, thanks for coming out, snowy day. Um, so yeah, uh, now this thing keeps going off. Uh oh. What's the, <laughs> like, is there a way to keep it on? I don't know why it went off. Yeah. Oh, somehow it got unplugged. Oh, well, that'll do it. Yeah. So, it's on, it's, it's getting there. Yeah. It's warming up. <laughs> More later. Okay, we'll try it again. All right, so it's, uh, yeah, the uh, land of milk and honey, you know, right before the uh, pandemic started, we came out with this, the worst timing ever to release a book, but anyway, um, it came out pretty good for a book, and so I thought I'd just share with you some of the highlights from it. Um, uh, basically, you should, just, just so you know, bees, the, the European honeybee, they're not native to this land. Um, you know, they, they all came from Europe, basically, or Asia, or Africa. Um, in fact, they were known as the white man's fly by the native Indian people um, because uh, the, they, they started noticing these bees showing up after the white settlers came, and and they would they called it the white man's fly because the bees sort of there was always kind of you know the, the, the settlers. Uh, actually, first brought them over. Uh, documented evidence we have is 1622. Just one of the ships shortly after the Mayflower came over. They brought some some beehives, and of course the hives would swarm and, and reproduce and start spreading uh, around the countryside. And the native uh, indigenous people were very very keen observers of, of nature, and they noticed them. But they noticed they were always associated with the, the white men who were keeping them. <laughs> they probably didn't know they were keeping them, but they always noticed they were around. And, and when they saw them, they, they could tell that the settlers were coming, you know, within 50 to 100 miles away. They were getting close, closing in on their territory, kind of a thing. Um, so, so all the bees here in America today actually were brought over. There was some, some uh, fossil evidence they found in Nevada uh, of, of uh, an ancestor of the honeybee. Um, that they could tell uh, through the vein, veins in the wings and, and, and the fact that they have hairs on their eyes. They're, they're the only insect that have tiny hairs on their, on their compound eyes. And they also um, have, have a barbed stinger. And the honeybee's the only one with a barbed stinger. And they found fossilized evidence of, of such a critter um, in, in Nevada, but that was dated some 40 million years ago. Uh, but for some reason, they all died out. Uh, and so all the bees here in America today came from overseas and were brought here. Immigrants. Yeah, they were immigrants. And so, so um, 
the bees started to spread out and uh, one of the earliest uh, writings we have of uh, 1974 Samuel Williams wrote in the natural and civil history of Vermont and I'm going to quote from our earliest acquaintance with Lake Champlain the honeybee was to be found in the open lands along those shores at a distance of 100 miles from the English and French settlements and long before those settlements had begun to attend to the cultivation of this animal. And from the first settlement of New England, hunting for their nests has been a favorite and profitable amusement. But as the chief food of the bee is from the blossoms and flowers of the plants, it does not multiply so fast in the uncultivated parts of the country, where the improvements of agriculture and gardening for constantly producing a greater variety and number of vegetables. And so um, the, uh, he mentions in there the, the hunting of the bees. And that was early on one of the early things that people would do. You might hunt deer, hunt turkey, you could hunt bees. And they would use something similar to this, or in some cases, exactly like this. Um, this is apparently. Um, this gentleman back here brought it in. Uh, Rain Nolan. Renee. Rene. Rene. Green. Green Nolet. Green Nolet. He uh, Dorset. Maybe, maybe you all know of him. Um, apparently, this is a, he probably built this. I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. And uh, this would be a bee box where he'd capture a bee and you feed it uh, some sugar syrup or some honey. Usually, you, you, it's a good idea. Well, you know now anyway that make it a strong smelling so because the bees have a good sense of smell and that way they can find it again when they want to come back so you, you feed it and then you and then you can open up this hatch and let the bee out and follow and see which way it would fly and it would walk you know as long as far as you go until you lost track and then you'd stop and you set it out and wait and the bee will come back looking for more and then when he flies back to its home you follow it again and you just keep following each time he comes back until you find you find the hive and um, there was actually a law in Vermont that um, if you, you found a bee tree, you, you put your mark on it, and those bees were yours. You were allowed, it doesn't matter whose land it was on. You, you were allowed to take those he bees. Had a, he had a tree. He had a, uh, a nail with his name on it. Oh, a nail. He put it in the tree. He, he put it in the tree. Okay. And the tree was his. Yep, right. The loggers couldn't come and cut the right. tree down. It doesn't matter whose land it was or anything. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think they finally took that off the books, but I'm not sure. <laughs> anyway, I thought I'd pass this around if you want to take a quick look. Very old, be, be gentle. Okay. Um, and so uh, the first um, bees that were brought over were brought in skeps, which were made of uh, like, you know, uh, straw and, and dung and mud or whatever. Um, but the, the skill required uh, to make these was probably limited, and so shortly after um, these were brought over, people started using other things to keep the bees in. A, a common um, uh, thing was using basically what we call uh, gum. It would be like a, a section of a tree that the bees moved into. You would cut, cut that out, might be five, six, eight feet. And, and you would move that to your, your dooryard or wherever you wanted to keep the bees. Um, and then uh, later on, people just used wooden boxes. Um, the problems with all these, though, is, is that they had fixed uh, combs. So the bees would build their comb in there, but there was no way to get it out, basically, without killing the bees. And so they would use sulfur, usually, uh, fumes, burn it, and it would kill the bees, and then they could harvest the honey. And so, that was, that was one of the uh, early ways of, of keeping bees. Here's an example of a gum, uh, uh, you know, like a, a section of a tree that might be used uh, by beekeepers. Uh, this one has a little roof over the top to keep the rain off, it looks like. And she's out there with her pail gathering up some honey. And, and that would be, that's a pretty fancy box hive there. Usually they're just six pieces of wood hammered together with a little hole for the bees to go in and out. And um, that one's got fancy uh, copper edging. Um, but uh, there is a, a beekeeper, a commercial beekeeper named Crane, J. E. Crane, James Crane. He was from um, Bridport. Uh, a lot of the beekeepers 
in, in the book, uh, although there's some from Dorset and from around here, there, um, most of them are actually in Addison County. Addison County has always been kind of the epicenter of beekeeping in Vermont, um, partly because of the large open fields and expanses, a lot of dairy farming there or, or sheep farming at the time. Um, probably also it was in between the two major city centers of Burlington and Rutland. You had the, uh, the, 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 the lake was there for, for boat transport early on, and then of course you had the railroad, so they had access to the markets there. Um, uh, and, the, and the other reason probably also is at one time Middlebury was actually the capital and had the largest population of any town in Vermont back in like early 1800s. And so when beekeeping was getting going, that's kind of where one of the, some of the first beekeeping associations were formed. In fact, the Vermont Bee Association, the State Bee Association, has its roots in the Addison County Bee Association that was first formed. Um, and so, so anyway, that's where most of the beekeepers are. So this guy, uh, James Crane, um, he, uh, in, let's see here, he uh, described what it was like to keep bees in Vermont uh, from 1850 to 1879. And this is what he has to say. Hives, for the most part, were made of boards of uneven widths or straw or sometimes a section of a hollow log. The size or capacity of these hives varied from half a bushel to two bushels or more. Everyone, so far as I remember, had a bee house, an open shed 12 or 15 feet long by four or five feet wide, open on the south side and boarded up on the north side and also on the ends. There were two shells, one near the ground, the other about three feet above on which the hives were set. Sometimes, setting up at one end of the house, there was a section of a trunk of a tree six or eight feet long that had been brought in from the woods with a runaway swarm in it. For the most part, honey was taken in the fall by killing the bees with sulfur fumes. The best combs were cut out for the table, and the darker combs were put through a strainer by the good housewife. <laughs> so, that was the way beekeeping went for quite a while, but then beekeepers wanted to try, you know, one of, and it's still true today, beekeeping is kind of a, 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 a creative thing, and like farming, you're free, kind of follow it your own way in many respects, and so many of the beekeepers of the day started tinkering and trying to figure out better ways to keep bees. And one of the more successful early ones was uh, Weeks. This guy, John Weeks, he was from um, Salisbury, actually, just outside of Middlebury, and he developed what he called the Weeks Hive. There is a, uh, a, a little sample of it at the Sheldon Museum in Middlebury. And um, with it, he, what he did, he also wrote a book on beekeeping that he published <laughs> as well that went along with it. And this had the very uh, pithy title of a manual or easy method of managing bees in the most profitable manner to their owner with infallible rules to prevent their destruction by the moth. <laughs> that was the title of the book. Um, and, and basically, it, it was kind of cross-marketing. He was the first one to pretty do this quite successfully, where he had a book about how to keep the bees, how to use his hive to keep the bees, and he sold the hive as well. And we see after, uh, shortly after this, a lot of other beekeepers started doing similar things. They would come out with their own patented hive, and they would have a book that goes with it that they would sell. Even one of the more uh, famous uh, beekeepers, uh, a guy named Langstroth, which is uh, Lorenzo Langstroth. He was actually from like Massachusetts originally and lived in Philadelphia. Uh, but his hive actually... Um, was built around the idea of bee space. Uh, this, the, the minister, Reverend Langstroth, he went observing the bees. He, he saw that in nature, they would always tend to build their combs the same distance apart. And he called this bee space. It turns out that this was an area they wouldn't fill with comb or anything, as, and, and, and it would act like a passageway for the bees. Like, it was just big enough for two bees, one walking on this comb, one walking on this comb, to pass each other back to back. And so he designed a hive respecting this bee space with the idea that maybe 
he could have a removable comb that he wouldn't have to cut out to, to harvest it or whatever, and it worked. And so today's hives pretty much all um, use this, this concept of bee space. Unfortunately, the Weeks hive kind of went into disuse. Um, it didn't have uh, enough novel um, characteristics like most of the hives that were produced and patented back then. Uh, but Langstroth's hive was the one with the bee space. That's the one we're still using today, over 150 years later, same technology, uh, which is one of the reasons why maybe you'll understand why I don't even own a smartphone. Um, I, I like the old technology, right? So, so what we have today is, is what was called the removable frame hive. Um, and we, we, um, this, when, when this was developed, it was at a 1852 is, was when uh, Langstroth uh, patented that, that hive uh, design. Um, although he wasn't the first one to actually come up with it. Believe it or not, there was people in Europe, and even back in ancient Greek, they had skeps with bars that would go across that were remo kind of uh, removable in, in some sense. So, but he, he was the one that patented it, so he got the credit. Right? Um, anyway, so that's what today's hides are uh, all designed around. And then, and when we, it, one of the challenges though is to get the bees to build their comb inside that frame, um, and so. Uh, that was one of the one of the things they had to work on. There was a few things that had to happen before we could have a bee industry. One was the removable frame hive. The other thing was is, is a good uh, efficient use of smoke to to be able to work with the bees. Um, as we understand, smoke distracts the bees, and because they could remember, I mentioned that bees have a very strong sense of smell, and and it turns out that that's one of their primary ways of communicating. Okay, when they're like an alarm, uh, you know, there's somebody threatening the hive, the guard bees at the entrance will give off an alarm pheromone, and the other bees smell it, and they know there's an issue, and so the other bees will come out to help chase off, uh, off the predator, or whatever the issue is. And by blowing smoke, though, in the hive, it helps cover up that smell, so the bees can't all communicate and organize, and all come after you at once. It makes working with bees a lot more fun, and so <laughs> these days, most people, use smokers. Um, and so that was uh, a smoker design uh, with a bellows uh, was first designed back in the 1800s. Um, remember I mentioned trying to get the comb built in that frame, the removable frame. Well, another invention that came out around that time was foundation, a thin sheet of beeswax that had the hexagon shape of the comb embossed in the surface so that the bees would use that as a, basically a foundation to build their comb off of. So you put that into the frame, and then they'd build their comb in the frame. If you didn't put it in there, often they'd build the comb any old which way, and it, it wouldn't be in the frame. So it kind of defeated the purpose of having a frame. And then the other thing, the fourth thing that happened was the invention of the honey extractor. Centrifugal, it kind of works like your washing machine, right? When it spins, all the water runs out, and it helps dry the clothes. Well, that same kind of idea here, the centrifugal force of the spinning combs on end like that, um, and, and the honey will run out and it'll run down the side of the tanks so we can collect it and, and bottle it. And with those four um, inventions that all happened in later half of the 1800s is what led to the ability of the development of a beekeeping industry. Uh, the really industrializing of beekeeping. Before then, it was all pretty much just homestead, um, subsistence, uh, beekeeping. Every farm pretty much had a, some bees on their farm for their own use. You know, they might have a few extra, but um, it was mostly, you know, for their own pollination and their own use. And, but once these, uh, these technical breakthroughs of a smoker, the removable frame, the foundation, and the extractor, which allows us now to remove the comb, extract the honey, and put the comb back in their hive so they can refill it instead of having to destroy it like they used to do in the old days with the skeps. That made beekeeping much more profitable, more efficient, and be able to produce a lot more honey. And so that's when we started to see the um, development of the, um, uh, the industry. So one of the uh, early uh, uh, beekeepers who was a, a large beekeeper uh, was A.E. Manum. He was in Bristol, from Bristol, Vermont, also in Addison County. Um, he had uh, survived the Civil War, 
came back, started up a beekeeping business, and he, he did a lot of uh, innovation in the old bee books. He, he, he would write, and they talked about him. Um, he was one of the first ones to develop out yards, because he had uh, at one point some 700 hives, which is quite a lot in Vermont these days. But back then, it was huge. Um, and uh, he, he, so he was the first one that you know, couldn't keep them all right by his house. So he developed out yards and other places where you would keep the hives. Um, he also um, did, he did a, quite a number of things. I'm trying to think off the top of my head. Oh, car comes to me. Um, but here's actually a picture of his covered wagon and horses that he would use to go collect uh, the honey. Uh, now, bees and horses do not mix. Um, and so you can see he covered the horses with white sheets to try to protect them um, so that, that they wouldn't, you know, get stung um, uh, as he collected, collected the honey. He was also one of the first ones to actually use a, a hive scale, where you put the hive on a scale and each day you can check the weight and tell whether the bees are gathering honey and storing it and the hive's getting heavier or there's a dearth and the bees are eating the honey they have and they're getting lighter. And he was one of the first ones to do that as well. Here's a picture of A.E. Manham's home apiary in Bristol at the time, back in the late 1800s. Um, you can actually count that he had like 100 hives there. And according to the literature, he reported his average honey harvest was about 100 pounds every year. Okay, Very different from today. This was back when sheep was huge and they had lots of, um, you know, open fields for, for the, for the um, uh, forage for the, for the sheep. They were growing a lot of hay and different, you know, uh, legumes and things for the sheep. And they didn't have the kind of machinery they have today, right? They were out there with size harvesting, which, you know, they might get several acres done in a day with a crew of guys if they were lucky. And as opposed to today, where one farmer with the right equipment, you can cut and bale, you know, a thousand acres in no time, right? Um, so back then, uh, the bees did really well. These days, bees don't do so well. Um, basically, maybe 50 or 60 hives in one place at one, in, in a really good spot is about the max you're going to get and still get a decent honey crop normally. And, and the average honey crop uh, in Vermont these days is around 60, 65 pounds. So it's, it's almost half of what it used to be. Yeah? Just to just point out, when you say 60 pounds, 70 pounds, or 100 pounds, that's per hive. Per hive, correct, per on, hive. A, on average. Just want to clarify right. that. So that means, you know, some hives might do more, some hives would do less. And if you're a beekeeper, you know that's typically the way it goes. About 130 hives do great, produce extra. 130 hives maybe just manage to keep themselves stable enough on their own, and then 130 hives need help and need feeding and don't do much of anything. That's typically how it tends to go. So, uh, so that's, that's the uh, Manum apiary uh, in the summer. That was his apiary in the winter. They used to get a lot more snow back then before the climate started shifting. Is that uh, a photograph? Or yeah, it, I believe it's a photograph. <clears throat> yep. What year is this? This would be the late 19, uh, 1800s. This was uh, taken from, um, uh, uh, it's called uh, ABCXYZ of Beekeeping, um, which is still actually in print with updated versions. Uh, it's an old, old book uh, put out by AI Root Company, which is still around today, making candles and, and uh, uh, is actually publishers of, of Bee Culture Magazine and other books. Um, and um, in their book, they, they had uh, A.E. Manum, they, this is where where we've got a lot of the information about what I've been sharing with you, and then this, this picture was in, it was in one of the 1890-something editions of the ABC XYZ of beekeeping. Although it may have been just the ABC of beekeeping back then. They added XYZ in future uh, editions. Um, another uh, commercial beekeeper at the time was James Crane, who you heard a quote from earlier. This is him cleaning uh, some uh, comb honey. That the, the, in the old days, they used to have basswood um, comb honey boxes that they put in the hive and the bees would fill it and they would just take it, the whole section right out and maybe put it in a package of some kind and, and sell, it, sell it that way. Um, 
Uh, this is because back then, uh, the late 1800s, early 1900s, and, and actually still today, uh, there's a lot of cases of adulteration of honey. Today, honey is the third most adul adulterated food product where people will add things to it like sugar syrup or something because honey is kind of expensive. So if they can boost their profits by adding sugar syrup, they make more money. Unfortunately, uh, it also happens with olive oil. Olive oil, I think, is the number one most adulterated food product today. Um, where people add other oils to it, so you're not always getting that pure olive oil when you think you are. And so this was an issue even back then, and that's why um, there was a period, the, the golden age of comb honey, where basically people only wanted comb honey, because they figured if it was in the comb, it was real honey, as opposed to in a jar or something liquid, who knows what was in it, right? Um, and so the comb honey got really big, most beekeepers <laughs> sold their honey in the comb. There wasn't a lot of liquid honey like there is today, where now it's the opposite. Comb honey is kind of rare, and most people get it in a liquid form. Uh, James Crane, he was another big beekeeper, had seven, 800 hives or so um, in, out in Bridport area in, in Addison County. He, he was the one, one of the people that first pioneered the use of cardboard boxes for shipping. Uh, before that, everyone shipped their stuff in wooden crates. And when they came out these cardboard boxes, no one believed it was strong enough to hold anything. So he had to have, uh, you know, advertisements of a man standing on the box to prove to people it was strong enough it could handle being shipped uh, either on trains or, you know, a wagon or on a ship or whatever, uh, and it would get you there. Um, and so, so he, he, he did quite a lot, too. And both of these beekeepers were very involved in the uh, Bee Association. Um, the Vermont Beekeepers Association, whom uh, Renee uh, Nolet, uh, your, your local uh, uh, green, 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 green Nolet. Nolet. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. Um, he, he was a, a former president of the Vermont Bee Association as well. Um, and, um, and, you know, we're a small state, so, you know, the beekeepers kind of, we all kind of know each other, basically. It's, sort of how it goes. Um, this is a, a picture of Roland Forbes and his son at their home area, apiary in St. George, which is uh, more up in like Chittenden County. Um, he is one of the few examples we have, a really well uh, documented example of a, a farmer who used bees uh, as part of the farm. Um, and uh, we know this because he kept a diary and copies of his diary from the 1890-ish uh, to about 1940 uh, are at the special collection in the Middlebury College collection. And I got to read through all that and got to, after a while, I got good at reading his handwriting. Um, <laughs> he just scribbled in stuff that he did and, uh, and he kept bees for a lot of while. So he would buy queen bees sometimes, sold his honey at the local, locally, uh, uh, at some of the, you know, Williston or, or in Burlington uh, or uh, uh, Col uh, Colchester, Essex Junction, wherever. Um, and, but he also produced lots of other stuff from fruits, vegetables, and meats, and maple syrup, I mean, everything. He, he, he was a hard-working guy. He did have some help. He hired people now and then. But, um, uh, uh, and so uh, back then, of course, this was getting into the early, 1900s now um, you know one of the big problems we had in the state was with disease and the most deadly of all the diseases is American foul brood which we still have today but back then uh, we didn't understand the disease that well um, and it was rampant uh, it's estimated roughly 20% or one out of every five hives in the state is diseased <clears throat> and this disease is deadly um, it, it usually kills the hive, and it's very contagious, and it spreads very easily. And so this was a huge ongoing problem, and it led to the development of a, the establishment of an apiary inspector for the state. So we'd have a professional uh, who would go around, inspect hives, catch disease, make sure it got treated or uh, eradicated, usually by burning all the infected equipment, because these spores from the disease, they, they could live for over 50 years 
Yeah, it's really difficult to get rid of. Um, and so that's, that's when, uh, around the 1920s, uh, we, the first uh, bee inspectors uh, in the state were uh, appointed. Um, later on, uh, one of the bee inspectors, Rich Drutchess, in the 1980s, he uh, uh, had a dog that he um, would use to sniff out the foul brood disease in the hives. And um, so I'm going to read from you here a, a, a page from the book. Um, based on experiences in Maryland and Michigan, Drutchess and the Vermont State Police Canine Corps trained a dog named Max to sniff out the distinctive rotting larva smell of American foul brood. The dog had been too rambunctious to be a drug sniffer, but for a couple of years he was good at identifying a American foul brood. Drutchess would lead him through a yard and he would stop and sniff at the offending colony. Max could only be used during the cold weather, though, when the bees were not flying. During the spring of 1986, they ran the dog past 890 hives and 44 apiaries. Max sat at 21 hives, of which 14 were verified as being diseased. Now, when it came to actually destroying the hives to control the disease, this is what Drutchess had to say, quote, Yes, we had the law's requirement and the police power to go and burn hives, but you never wanted to come in like a cop and say, do it or else. You had to talk people into it, I'd explain why we had the law, I'd do the toothpick demonstration, I'd promise to send the sample off to the U.S. Department of Agriculture Laboratory in Beltsville, Maryland, and when they understood the law, most people complied readily. And if we had to burn the hive, I always had the beekeeper light the match. One year, I spotted an abandoned hive on one farm I passed. I stopped and it was full of American foul brood. When I looked at the barn, there were a dozen other hives loaded with foul brood. And when I went and told the farmer's wife, we'd have to come back and would have to burn those hives. So in about two weeks, I came back with my assistant we knocked on the door and the farmer's son comes to the door. We told him we were here to burn the hives and we had talked to his mother about it. And he turns and he points towards the living room and there she was, laid out on the sofa, dead. Really embarrassed, we said, oh my gosh, we'll, we'll come back later. But outside, my assistant said, let's not wait, let me talk to this guy. So gently but insistently, we tell the son that we'll dig a hole We'll burn all the equipment, we'll cover it up, and he wouldn't have to worry about it. Then the son said, well, we could use our tractor to dig that hole. Oh, that's good, we said. And would this be today, the son asked? Yeah, absolutely, we said. Then the boy looked up with a big smile and said almost to himself, won't that make the neighbors think? <laughs> so beekeeping's always an adventure. So now, uh, basically in the late 1920s, we had Charles Mraz, uh, who moved to Vermont. He uh, went to work with uh, Philip Crane, J.E. Crane's um, son, who had taken over the business. And he worked with him for a few years until he bought him out and started his Champlain Valley Apiaries in 1931. He, he moved to Vermont in 1928 from uh, Long Island, New York. and. Uh, he, he became, uh, he was a world famous beekeeper. Um, he he uh, really developed several different beekeeping pieces of equipment uh, and invented them that are still used today from uh, a, um, uh, a, a screen, what do they call that now? A, um, for uh, harvesting honey, uh, you basically take uh, a screen, uh, it's a a board that has a cloth on one side and you you put a chemical on there that evaporates a fume board a fume board thank you it was thank you um and and we call it a fume board and and you put it on top of the hive and as the fumes uh drift down into the hive that it drives the bees down because they don't like the smell and they leave and so that you can put it on the top box and they'll drive them out of that box and then you can take the box off five minutes later and there's hardly any or no bees in it. Um, and he also invented a chain on capping machine 
but he's probably most well known for, for his use of, um, and his promotion of apotherapy, which is the use of bee products for healing and health. And what he discovered was uh, that bee stings can actually help you, believe it or not, with healing and health. Um, he had heard this old wives' tale, or old beekeeper's tale, of uh, bees supposedly being helpful with arthritis. And he had developed really bad arthritis in his knees because he had had uh, scarlet fever when he was younger. And so one day, out of just trying out of a lark, he put a couple bees on the inside of each of his knees um, to see if it would help. And he didn't think much more about it until the next day he woke up and he just got out of bed. And, and, and then it took him a little while to realize his knees weren't hurting him like usual. And that led him on a 60 plus year odyssey to study and learn about the use of bee stings for various uh, things that he found, mostly rheumatic diseases like arthritis, but also multiple sclerosis apparently can help with, and, and other things. Um, and so uh, he also became uh, one of the, uh, he was a state bee inspector for a while, president of the bee association, <coughs> things like that. Um, he, uh, his son on, on your left, was Bill, uh, who took over from him uh, in the 1970s, 80s, and then that, um, Bill's son, Chaz, uh, has recently taken over uh, a couple, maybe 20 years ago or so, and he's running, so it's a third generation beekeeper now, still running Champlain Valley Apios there in Middle Bay. I mentioned a little bit about beekeepers associations. Here's an early picture, uh, probably around 1900s or so in Addison County of early bee association. Um, the uh, first one was the um, Addison County Bee Association, they called it, uh, in eight, late eight, uh, 1870s. And then the 1880s, they changed the name to the Champlain Valley Beekeepers Association to take in more of the, the area. Um, uh, but then uh, later, another, maybe, uh, actually, 80s or 90s of, of 1800s, then they changed it again to the Vermont Beekeepers Association. And so that, that original <coughs> bee association that was started in Middlebury evolved, changed its name basically, and it's still the Vermont Bee Association that we have today that's still going. Um, and uh, there, there was a few local bee associations until about 2006, 2007, when we started having the latest big die-off of bees. You may have heard of the colony collapse disorder. Well, um, that uh, got a lot of more interest in bees and beekeeping in the state, and so we had a lot of new associations started up, including one that was uh, uh, started up by a, a resident of Dorset here. Um, maybe you know Prophet Scout. Um, she, she was a co-founder of the Southern Vermont Bee Association. Um, we got that going here in this area, because there wasn't a lot going on Um, the Bee Association also uh, did a lot of work to, to promote beekeeping, educate the public about beekeeping, and that kind of thing. And one of the things they did a lot was to um, go to fairs and have a, have a honey booth and, and talk to people about bees and that kind of thing. And so um, here, here's a, a short piece that was um, uh, written by my co-author, Bill Mayers. Um, from Chittenden County, who, who used to be in the legislature, and he had done a Vermont Public Radio commentary in September of 2011, where he uh, talks about serving at the fair. So this is Bill Mears, quote, For a number of years, I have volunteered to sell honey and talk bees at the Vermont Beekeepers Association booth at the Tunbridge World Fair. Country fairs like this one evolved to offer end-of-the-summer sensory overload with music, food, rides, competition, and merchandise. But sorting out my thoughts at this year's fair was like trying to untangle debris along flood-ravaged river from Hurricane Irene. It began as I drove the mere five miles from Bethel to South Royalton. After its rampage, the White River with its bank, back within its banks, uh, well, the White River was back within its banks, its color a sullen gray. The river had chewed new channels. Fields were scoured, scraped and scooped, and covered with silt. 
Rows of corn showed the high water marks. Two bridges looked as if they had been bombed. Tunbridge, however, lay in a valley of relative tranquility. The cattle barns had been cleaned of silt, the bridges were secure, and the fields were dry. Scores of polite Norwich University cadets in green and blue sweatshirts directed the parking. On the way in, I chatted with Euclid Farnham, a longtime president of the fair. He said they knew that attendance would be down, but they never thought of canceling, nor had they canceled 10 years ago in the weeks after the 9-11 attacks. Instead, I remembered they had the 10 minutes of silence, which was broken only by the occasional lowing of a cow. I ambled along the midway, moving through the ranks of kiosks with the usual heart-stopping foods like sausages, burgers, onion, and french fries, past robotic carnival workers at pitch and toss and shooting galleries and through forests of rides. Politicians hawked their promises and dreams. The National Guard sold patriotic adventure. Others sold tractors, insurance, t-shirts, and fudge. Inside the Dodge Gilman building, we beekeepers shared space with Cabot Cheese, the Christmas Tree Growers Association, the Grange, or patrons of husbandry, and racks upon racks of prized vegetables and fruits, pumpkins as big as altering vehicles. Our six hour shift went nonstop. The world came to us. The thin, the round, the young, the old, the fleet, the lame. We had three irresistible attractions. One was great local Vermont honey to taste and buy. We sold plastic honey sticks by the thousands. Secondly, we would answer anxious questions despite that despite poor weather this year, Vermont bees were in relatively good health. But the biggest draw was our observation hive with 3,000 bees crawling around beneath the glass, safe from human harm. Everybody from toddlers to totterers with canes could play the beekeeper's version of Where's Waldo as they searched for the queen bee. We were a little short of help when one volunteer bowed out with a broken foot and another with a broken leg, and <laughs> Del Cloud, the town manager of flood-stricken Bethel, asked for a rain check. But in the end, however, we had enough volunteers, and what's more, we were named the best booth in the entire fair, a prize which gets us in free next year. <laughs> so, you know, beekeeping's got its challenges. Um, it's had, always had challenges. And even today, there's a lot of challenges. Um, one of the biggest ones is uh, land use. You know, more land is being developed and there's less forage available. The, the farming practices have changed. Farmers aren't, you know, when they're not growing as much clover and alfalfa anymore. Uh, economics seems to be favoring corn or soybeans, which doesn't typically do a lot for the bees. And, and of course, they've got the equipment to harvest the, the hay when it does grow uh, a lot quicker, often ideally they know that they get the biggest, best protein right before it blooms. So they, the farmers really don't want it to bloom um, for, their, for the, what their use. But of course, for the pollinators, it's best if it blooms, right? Um, so that, that's a big uh, uh, problem too, you know, the, the, the agricultural system and, and the way the industrialization. Uh, another one of the issues is, is the use of pesticides. Um, which is really pretty devastating for, for all pollinators, including the honeybees. Um, we don't really have good regulatory protections in this country, despite all the money they get spent for that kind of thing. Um, and, and, you know, quite frankly, it's easy uh, to point out all the different systems that aren't working right and, and causing problems for the bees, um, but really, in my opinion, the underlying root problem with what's going on with bees today, standing here in front of you and sitting in your seat. Because we're all part of this society and we're all supporting these systems that are being harmful, even with the climate change and the kind of energy we use or you know, the systems we use. Um, and for me, uh, when I realize that I I'm actually part of the problem that's actually inspiring. Because now I have the potential to be part of the solution, right? Because if it wasn't my problem, 
that's someone else's issue. Let them deal with it. I don't have to change anything. But when I realize now I'm part of what's going on too, and I can look at what I'm doing and what I need to maybe change to help make things better for the bees. So for example, you know, I certainly don't use pesticides, um, but you know, I, and I, I won't, not, I don't, don't want to offend you, and you, most of you look like you're probably retired, so you're probably not working for the pesticide companies, but maybe we're buying products from other people who do use pesticides, right? So we're all part of perpetuating this kind of systems and the harm that's happening. And so we all can play a role in finding a way to, to, to uh, resolve that. And to me, the bees provide inspiration. Because when you look at how the bees go about making their living, taking what they need from the earth around them to survive, they gather, what do they gather? You guys know, right? There's a beekeeper here. Pollen, nectar. Pollen, nectar. What else do they gather? Water and tree resins that they use to make propolis. That, those four things, is all they need to take from the world around from, uh, to survive. And, and that along with the, you know, the air that they breathe and the warmth of the sun that they soak up, that's all they need to survive. And yet by taking those things, they actually don't hurt anything. They, not so much as a leaf on a plant is injured or killed, right? But by taking what they need through pollination, um, they actually make the world better through pollination. So there's an abundance of fruits and vegetables, all shapes, sizes, and colors. And there's an abundance for all the other insects and animals and all of us. So what a great lesson I'm always trying to work into my life is how to live in such a way that, first of all, I do no harm or the least amount of harm possible. But secondly, I do things in a way that hopefully improves the world brings more life and, and more biodiversity into the world. And now you're probably saying, oh, that sounds really great, but it's kind of idealistic. What, I'm just one person. What, what can I do, right? Well, again, the bees have so much to teach us. It turns out that it's estimated that working its entire lifetime, one honeybee, a worker bee, can gather enough nectar to make one twelfth of a teaspoon of honey. So it takes 12 bees working their whole life to make one teaspoon of honey that you get to enjoy in your coffee or your tea. Now, to get through a winter in Vermont, and, and a whole year, I mean, we usually leave 60, 80 pounds for the winter, and, the, uh, and they use even more in the summer because they're so active. We use 150 to 200 pounds of honey every year just to survive. One twelfth of a teaspoon, right? It sounds insignificant. But the bees don't fall for the illusion that what they do is insignificant, right? They do what they can do, and they count on all their brothers and sisters in the hive to do their part, and together, they make miracles happen. Hundreds of pounds of honey. And so, it was, I think it was um, Mahatma Gandhi that said, what you do may seem insignificant, but it's important that you do it. Because what you do matters. It has an effect on you. <laughs> And so that's why, you know, the bees have, have taught me so much. They're still teaching me, and, and why I'm so grateful for them. I'm, I'm happy to have been able to work with some other beekeepers in the state to put together kind of a, a history of Vermont beekeeping. We're actually trying to encourage other states to do the same thing because there are history books out there on, like, nations, like American beekeeping or world beekeeping, but does very rarely do you get down to the more granular uh, beekeeping within like a state or a territory where, as you heard, they've got interesting characters and, and, and you miss a lot of uh, fun kind of stories that you, you wouldn't normally uh, catch otherwise from that bigger perspective. Um, so I just want to, I guess I'll end it there and, and unless there's any questions, do we have time for questions? Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> How have you changed <laughs> How your, your practices in the last few years? relative to what you were just thinking How about. have I changed my practices in terms of, I mean, there's a lot of changes. Is there anything <laughs> specific? <laughs> well, relative to climate change and, and um, processing and, and what you're doing with your Yeah, beliefs. well, I'm still, the climate is shifting so fast. I mean, I got caught this year. I've still got my empty boxes stored on top of my hives that I usually take off after a couple hard frosts where I can put them away and I don't have to worry 
worry about the wax worms getting in and the wax moths. But it was so warm for so long, and then all of a sudden it's gotten really cold. I only have half of them off, and and then some. I got to get out now in fields full of snow and try to. I'm not sure how I'm going to do it. So uh, it's an ongoing um, thing that we're in the middle of. Um, uh, one of the things I do do is I leave. I mean, I always fed my bees honey rather than sugar syrup because they just I find they're healthier that way. But I leave more on than I normally used to. Um, because the winters are not predictable like they used to be. They're not consistent. Ideally, it would gradually get cold, stay cold, and it would gradually get warm. That would be the best for the bees. But sometimes we have huge shifts and swings in temperature. It could be 60 degrees difference from morning till night, and, and the next day, same thing. And that can throw the bees off because when it gets warm, they break their cluster, they move around, but then it gets cold, and they can't move around so easy, and they can get caught not clustered together and organized, and it can cause problems in the hive. Um, we've, you know, we've got this uh, economic system which moves goods all around the world and the globe, and unfortunately we're often moving uh, things with the goods that we don't intend to, but like, so we've got all kinds of insect pests and invasive pests that have been coming, and so we've got more issues with various um, like small hive beetles in recent years, and not to mention the mites, um, and the various diseases and viruses and things. Um, so it's ongoing uh, kind of challenges. Every year is different, um, which is why I kind of enjoy it in some sense, because I'm always learning. Everything's changing every year. You gotta reevaluate every, you know. Uh, it, um, as it says in the book, um, I forget who referred to, I think Sue Hubble referred to beekeeping as Farming for intellectuals, because there's no like rote way of doing it. You have to. Everybody does it differently because we're all got different reasons for keeping bees. We may have different types of bees, different types of hives, different microclimates and locations. All those things are going to affect how how you keep your bees. So it's it's ongoing. Um, there's been a lot of changes, and I'm sure there's going to be a lot more changes, and and it will keep changing. Yeah. What do the bees actually do in the winter time? They, they're still in the hives. Right? Yeah, they do what we all should do. They get together and snuggle and keep each other warm. <laughs> Literally, they get they, they 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 you know what we do. You you gather your firewood in the summer and and you burn it in the winter to keep warm. Well, the bees they gather that nectar, which is just like sugar water, and and they drive most of the moisture out, like maple making syrup, maple syrup. But this is honey, and, and they get that moisture level really low, and they store that concentrated sugar solution as in honey form, and they consume it and use the carbohydrates as energy to flex their wing muscles like shivering and create body heat. And by getting together in a big cluster, sharing, snuggling, um, they share that body heat, and that's how they get through the winter. Unlike most native pollinators, uh, solitary pollinators, which will actually go into hibernation, and, and their, their whole metabolism drops and they go into like a deep slumber, semi-comatose, sort of frozen, um, but not totally frozen. Well, the bees don't do that. They just become inactive, they get together, they share body heat, and, and like, I don't know, some of you are old enough to remember Pac-Man, the early, early video game, that little thing would go around eating. Well, that's what the bees do. They're, they're in the hive and they just eat their honey and they hope they don't run out until before it gets warm again and they can go out in the new flowers and get <coughs> more nectar and, and, and pollen for the new, the new season. And they're keeping their queen warm. Yes, the queen's so usually in the cluster. center of that cluster. <laughs> yeah. Well protected and kept, kept, kept warm. Yep. You had a question? Yeah, um, I haven't kept bees since moving to Vermont about 10 years ago. But we had a registration process there that you kept bees, you register with the state, and anybody that sprays, because a lot of people had sort of around us were spraying things, and and um, and so the sprayers, the garden people, had to register, had to uh, keep in touch with the state, and if they were going to one of our one of our beekeepers' property or in the perimeter, anybody that was around it, they had to tell the beekeepers that they were going to be there. I don't know, I was pretty hard to keep your bees home all day, but um, at least it persuaded the neighbors that there was something wrong with spraying because the, the beekeepers were always trying to get people to stop using these sprays. And, and do they have anything like that in Vermont, a registration of them, and so the sprayers have to? Unfortunately, not that I know of. No. 
Yeah, um, it's not a bad idea, but again, it, then it puts it, the onus is on the beekeeper to try to protect their bees from the spray because they're being told it's going to happen. When personally, I think right. it, the bees should just be protected from the sprays and we shouldn't be spraying toxic stuff yeah. around the environment every year. But it educated people somewhat. I mean, I mean, yeah, it does help with some, some a little, at least awareness is, is increased. Yeah. Yeah. Put these little signs down and you think, oh, Lord, mm -hmm. I think we're supposed to do that. But yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a difficult situation. Know, the farmers have gotten convinced by the pesticide salesmen that they need these chemicals to be able to farm. Never mind that we used to be able to do it without them for many years. Um, that's, that's just... So going organic is the best thing you can do. Organic or biodynamic, yeah. permaculture, yeah. those are all forms, or just your backyard. You could, you know, some of the healthiest food you can grow is right in your backyard. Yes. And you'll know whether not just, you know, you can avoid spraying chemicals and stuff, so you'll know it's good and clean and healthy, and yeah, and it doesn't have to travel far to your dinner plate. <laughs> Did you ever use a Kirchhoff hive? A Kirchhoff hive? It's bigger than the Langstroth, and we were sort of experimenting with it. Um, different beekeepers. It has two entrances. So you have two colonies. It's like a condo. And they all live separately. Only one queen in each colony. But they could all go to work together. Yeah. So two queen, queen hives. Yeah. yeah. So A lot of people do that. I've never bothered myself. But yeah. there are people that yeah. do it to try. Apparently, they, they'll, they, if you do it right, you can often get a bigger honey crop than with any si two single hives on their own. Yeah. 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 <laughs> And the question, yes. Yeah, two things. Um, you mentioned the um, growing number of difficulties in beekeeping. And maybe you said it, but I didn't hear it. One that seems to be increasing is bears. And um, what? Bears. Oh, yeah. Bears. Yeah. More, greater prevalence, and they're getting smart. Um, <laughs> they're stories, always smart, but yeah. Well, two stories from this summer. Um, two days after I broke my leg, Bears came and took out my hive. Hives. Um, and then... Kick a guy when he's down, right? <laughs> well, I think that's bad. Then in late September, um, a beekeeper friend of mine died. And the next day, the bears came for his hives. Oh, interesting. So they're, they're watching us. <laughs> they really are. Also, you mentioned um, scale crops. It's uh, yes. a legendary. Um, but another legendary beekeeper who's still around in the area, um, lives in West Paula, is Jack Rath. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and he, um, large animal vet over in Granville, New York, but then about 2010 or so, he bought Therapy over in Greenwich, New York, which, if you don't know, is the bee supply capital of the Northeast. And he really brought that back. It was, I think, on a little bit of a decline, mm -hmm. but, it's, it's a great place to go and get your beach supplies. And that's Jack Rath, and his wife used to teach over at Long Trail here in Georgia. Oh, really? Yeah. <coughs> so. He's in the book, too. <laughs> Just wanted to mention his name. Yeah. Um, you spoke about honeybees, but I'm not sure if you or the audience is aware that the Vermont Center for Eco Studies has been doing a census of the bees of Vermont beyond honeybees, and they have just released the report, um, and I just scanned it briefly before I came. Um, I think to date they've documented 60 species of bees that are in Vermont, and um, it's ongoing. I mean, mm -hmm. the, the yeah. census will continue. And um, many of them are, um, they're pollinators, but not, not honey producers. Right. And some, some of the species that found uh, have been becoming much more rare, especially certain species of bumblebee. Um, but other species of bumblebees have been increasing their population. So it tells you that the environment is not stable right now. If you've got lots of species, some of them are disappearing, other ones are growing, things aren't stable for sure. Well, the, the, and the bottom line of the whole survey is that they're finding species, identifying species that have never been identified in Vermont mm, before. Yep. So it's a... It's yeah, a, we don't even know half of what we got. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> yep. But uh, another thing that's just happened recently, um, you know, the, the, the state of Vermont has often 
for a long time taken samples from hives and things and tested and never found much in terms of pesticide uh, contamination. Um, so, but last year, the State Bee Association started taking its own samples and testing them, and we're finding lots of contamination. We don't really? understand how the state could have been doing this and not finding anything. But anyway, now that it's well documented, um, Dr. Samantha Alger at, uh, up in the uh, Vermont Bee Lab at UVM has been heading this and, and documenting this, and we're doing, taking more samples and doing more tests all around the state we're finding this. Um, southern, northern, east, west, and we, we, so we're hoping to start to bring this to the legislature and see if we can't get them to do more to protect the pollinators. So if you do hear that, that you might be hearing something in the news uh, about you know some kind of uh, legislation that's being considered maybe in this upcoming session to protect pollinators, hopefully you might consider calling your representatives at the time and maybe ask them to support that because you know, they rec it, it's uh, pollinators and bees, honeybees particularly. They're they're used for over a hundred food crops that that are they're, they're pretty much required because our industrial agricultural model, we don't have enough native pollinators. That, that you know, between using the land the way we do and the pet chemicals which kill the good bugs as well as the bad bugs, there's just not enough native pollinators. We have to bring in the honeybees to do the pollination. So if we lose all those honeybees. You know, it's not going to be good for our <laughs> ability to survive and have uh, lots of access to good, nutritious food. They, they, it's estimated about every third bite of food you eat is thanks to a honeybee. Um, so, so we we got to pay attention and, and do everything we can, I think, to to be better stewards of this wonderful earth and and, and try to take good care of her. Yes, yeah, I'm trying to think using uh, uh, bumblebees now to, uh, for the uh, orchard. Actually, mostly bumblebees get used in greenhouses because they, they tend not to fly that far from their nest, maybe a few hundred feet, um, and they, they stay pretty much close. So greenhouses, they work really well because they also don't try to get out. They don't fly at the light and hit the window, you know, like flies or bumblebees or honeybees, I should say. Um, they tend to be used for that mostly. But there are also mason bees or blue orchard bees that are also good for pollinating uh, orchards and fruit trees. As well, and so yeah, you know, just any putting in habitat for pollinators, and not just planting the pollinators, but even providing place for them to nest, um, is is, a, is also important. Does Vermont require labeling that indicates that there's been additives to honey? Um, in theory, but there's no one really policing it. I mean, the labeling is. I mean, I know beekeepers that heat their honey, but they say right on it, raw honey. Right. Because there's no definition and no one's policing it or anything. So it's, you've got to really talk to the beekeeper and ask them what they do to know. Like I can tell you my honey is actually raw. I don't even use a heated uncapping knife to remove the, the, the wax cappings when it, before I put it in the extractor. Every, you know, room temperature is, is the, hot, the hottest it gets, which, you know, during the summer it could be 90 degrees, but that's as hot as it gets. I, Whereas a lot, most beekeepers, especially if you get liquid honey, um, uh, it's going to be heated and filtered. Um, you heat it because it melts all the sugar crystals, and and it keeps it liquid longer. And then, also, but you have to filter out all the little bits of pollen that's in it. Otherwise, there's a nucleus around which the sugar crystals can start to form again. That's why they filter. And then, of course, when you heat honey, it changes the flavor. Uh, all you taste is sweet and then you filter out all the bits of pollen so you lose a lot of the nutritional value. So that's why, to me, raw honey is, 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 is just superior. I, you can taste actually the subtle flavor of the flower blossoms that the bees collected the nectar from when, when the honey's raw. You don't really get that after it's been heated, unfortunately. But most people don't know, you know, you gotta be a beekeeper to find these things out. Ross, thank you very much. Um, if there are more questions, we have um, some bloody brownies outside that Mary Stevenson brought, so um, help yourself to those. Upcoming events, December 3rd is our holiday open house. It's a Saturday from 11 to 1. Stop on by. We'll have um, the whole place decorated in different eras of Christmas. So it's the history of how Christmas has been celebrated and other holidays more recently. Um, endorse it. Um, and the 
the third Thursday in December. We do not have a program. We never do. Um, so don't come back the third Thursday of December for a talk. Just come to look at our great exhibits. Um, and then for our 2023 third Thursday lunchtime lectures, we are um, getting that slate together and we will be making that public soon. So I can't tell you now who the January speaker is. Anyway, Ross Conrad, thank you. Okay, thank you for having me, of course. Thanks for coming out, everybody. I do have some books and some money if anyone's interested. <laughs>